Chapter 21. The Escape. As the princess lay and sobbed, she kept feeling for the thread mechanically, following it with her finger, many times up to the stones where it disappeared. By and by, she began, still mechanically, to poke her finger in between the stones after the thread as far as she, they would go. All at once it came to her head that she might remove some of the stones and see where the thread went next. Almost laughing at herself for never having thought of this before, she jumped to her feet. Her fear vanished. Once more, she was certain her grandmother's thread could not have brought her there just to leave her. And she began to throw away the stones from the top as fast as she could, sometimes taking two or three in a handful, sometimes needing both hands to lift one. After clearing them away a little, she found that the thread turned and went straight downwards. Hence, as the heap sloped a good deal, growing over the course wider towards the base, she had to throw away the multitude of stones to follow the thread. But this was not all, for she soon found that the thread, after going straight down a little way, turned first sideways in one direction, then sideways in another, then shot at various angles, hither and thither inside the heap, so that she began to be afraid of having to clear all the huge gathering. She went, she was very much dismayed at this idea, but losing no time, went back to work with a will, and with an aching back and bleeding fingers and hands, she worked on, sustained by the pleasure of seeing the, slowly, the, hip, the heap slowly diminish and begin to show itself on the opposite side of the fire. Another thing which helped to keep her courage up was that often when she uncovered the thread, instead of being lying loose upon the stones, it tightened up and that made her feel certain her grandmother was at the other end of it somewhere. She'd got about halfway down when she started and nearly fell with fright. Close to her ear, it seemed, a voice broke out singing. Jibber bother smash, you old have a crash. Jabber smash bother. You're all the worst of pother. Smash, bother, jabba. Here Curdie stopped, either because he could not find a word that rhymed with jabber, or because he remembered what he had forgotten when he woke up to the sound of Irene's labours, that he was to pretend to be growing very weak so the goblins would think him dying. But he, but he had heard enough to let Irene, but he had uttered enough to let Irene know who it was. It's Curdie! she cried joyfully. Hush! Hush! came Curdie's voice again from somewhere. Speak softly! Why? You were singing very loud, said Irene. Yes, but they know I'm here. They don't know you are. Who are you? I'm Irene, answered the princess. I know who you are quite well. You are Curdie. Why? However did you come here, Irene? My great-great-grandmother sent me, and I think I found out why. You can't get out, I suppose. No, I can't. What are you doing? Clearing away the heap of stones. There's a princess, exclaimed, I, exclaimed Curdie in a tone of delight, though he was still speaking a little more than a whisper. I can't think how you got there, though. My grandmother sent me after her thread. I don't know what you mean, said Curdie, but you're here so, so it doesn't much matter. Oh, it does, returned Irene. I should never have found you here, but for her. You can tell me all about it when we get out then. There's no time to lose, said Curdie. Irene went to work, as fresh as when she'd begun. There's such a lot of stones, she said, and it would take me a long time to get them all away. How far have you got to? asked Curdie. I've got about half away, but the other half is so much bigger. I don't think you'll have to move the lower half. Do you see the slab laid up against the wall? Irene looked and felt about with her hands and soon perceived the outline of the slab. Yes, she answered, I do. Then I think, rejoined Curdie, when you have cleared the slab about halfway down or a little more, I shall be able to push it over. I must follow my thread, returned Irene, whatever I do. What do you mean? exclaimed Curdie. You will see it when I get you out, answered the princess. 
and went on harder than ever. But she was soon satisfied that what Curdie wanted done and what the thread wanted done were one and the same thing. For she only saw now that the thread turned and went away halfway down through a chink between the slab and the wall in the place where Curdie was confined so that she could not follow it any further until the slab was out of her way. As soon as she found this, she said in a joyous whisper, Now, Cardi, I think if you were to give a great push, the slab would tumble over. Stand quite clear then, said Cardi, and let me know when you're ready. Irene got off the heap and stood to one side of it. Now, Cardi, she cried. Cardi gave a great rush with his shoulder against it. Out tumbled the slab on the heap, and out crept Cardi on the top of it. You have saved my life, Irene, he whispered. Oh, Cardi, I am so glad. Now let's get out of this horrid place as fast as we can. Well, that's easier said than done, he returned. Oh, no, it's quite easy, said Irene. We have only to follow my thread. I am sure it will take us out now. She'd already begun to follow it over the fallen slab into the hole. Curdy was searching the floor of the cavern for his pickaxe. Here it is, he cried. No, that's not it, he added in a disappointed tone. What can it be then? Oh, I declare it's a torch. That is jolly. Much better than my pickaxe. Much better than if it weren't for those horrible stone shoes, he went on as he lighted the torch by blowing on the last embers of the fire. When he looked up, with the light of the torch casting its glare into the darkness of the huge cavern, he saw, caught sight of Irene just disappearing into the hole out of which he himself had just come. Where are you going there? he cried. That's not the way out. That's the other way I couldn't get out. I know that, whispered Irene, but this is the way my thread goes and I must follow it. What nonsense the child talks, said Cardi to himself. I must follow her though and see she comes to no harm. She will soon find she can't get out that way and then she will have to come with me. So he crept over the slab once more into the hole with his torch in hand. But when he got a look about in it, he could see her nowhere. And now he discovered that although the hole was narrow, it was much longer than he had supposed. For in one direction, the roof came down very low and the hole went off into a narrow passage of which he could not see the end. The princess must have crept in there. He got on his knees and one hand, holding the torch in the other, and crept after her. The hole it twisted about, in some parts so low he could hardly get through, in other parts so high he could not see the roof, but everywhere it was narrow. Too narrow for any of the goblins to get through, and so he presumed he had, they had never thought that Curdy might. He began to feel very uncomfortable lest something should have happened to the princess when he heard a voice, her voice ahead of him, almost close to his ear, whispering, Aren't you coming, Curdy? Then he turned the next corner and she stood there waiting for him. I knew you couldn't go wrong in that narrow hole, but now you must keep by me, for this place is much wider, she said. I can't understand it, Curdy said, half to himself, half to Irene. Never mind, she returned. Wait till we get out. Curdie, utterly astonished that she had already got so far, and by a path which he knew nothing of, thought he'd better at least do as she pleased. In all events, he said to himself, I know nothing about this way, minor at that I am, and she seems to think she does know something about it, although how she should passes by my comprehension. So she's just as likely to find her way as I am, and as she insists on taking the lead, I must follow. We can't be much worse off than we are now, anyhow. Reasoning thus, he followed her a few steps, and they came into another great cavern, across which Irene walked in a straight line, as confidently as if she knew every step of the way. Curdie went on after her, flas flashing his torch about, and trying to see something of what lay about them. Suddenly, he started back a pace, as his light fell upon something which lay close by Irene as she passed. It was a platform of rocks raised a few feet from the floor, covered with sheepskins. 
upon which lay two horrid figures asleep. Figures at once recognised by Cardi as the king and the queen of the goblins. He lowered his torch instantly, lest the light should wake them. As he did so, he flashed upon, it flashed upon his pickaxe, lying by the side of the queen, whose hand lay close by the handle of it. Stop a moment, he whispered. Hold my torch and don't let the light shine on their face. Irene shuddered when she saw the frightful creatures, whom she had passed without observing. But she did as he requested, turning her back, turning her back and held his torch very low in front of her. Curdy drew his pickaxe carefully away and as he did so, spied one of the Goblin Queen's feet projecting from under the skin. The great clumsy granite shoe, thus exposed to his hand, was too much of a temptation to be resisted. He laid hold of it and with careful efforts drew it off. The moment he succeeded, he saw to his astonishment that what he had sung about in ignorance to annoy the Queen was in fact true. She had six horrible toes. Overjoyed with his success and seeing the huge bump under the sheepskin where the other foot was, he proceeded to lift them gently. For if he could only succeed in carrying away the other shoe as well, he would be no more afraid of the goblins than of so many flies. But as he pulled on the second shoe, the queen gave a growl and sat up in bed. The same instant, the king awoke also and sat up next to her. Run, Irene, cried Curdie, for though he was not the least bit afraid for himself, he was afraid for the princess. Irene looked round and saw that the frightful creatures were awake, and like the wise princess she, did, she was, she dashed the torch on the ground and extinguished it, crying out, Hurry, Curdy, take my hand! He darted to her side, forgetting neither his pickaxe nor the queen's shoe, and caught hold of her hand, as she sp sped fearlessly through with her thread to guide her. They heard the queen giving a great bellow, but they had a good start, for it would take them some time to light the torches to pursue them. Just as they saw a glimmer behind them. Sorry, need to turn the page. Oh, there's an illustration, by the way. Sorry. I have trouble turning pages. Just as they saw the glimmer behind them, the thread brought them to a very narrow opening, through which Irene easily crept and Curdy with some difficulty. Now, said Curdy, I think we shall be safe. Of course we shall, returned Irene. Why do you think so? asked Curdy. Because my grandmother is taking care of us. That's all nonsense, said Curdy. I don't know what you mean. Well, then, if you don't know what I mean, what right have you to call it nonsense? said the princess, a little offended. I beg your pardon, Irene, said Curdy. I did not mean to vex you. Of course not, responded the princess. But why do you think we shall be safe? Because the king and queen are far too stout to get through this hole. There might be other ways round, said the princess. To be sure there might, but we are not out yet, acknowledged Curdy. But what do you mean by the king and queen, asked the princess. I should never call such creatures as those a king and a queen. Their own people do, though, answered Curdy. The princess asked more questions, and Curdie, as they walked leisurely along, gave her a full account, not only of the character and habits of the goblins, as so far as he knew them, but also of his own adventures with them, beginning from the very night after which he had found he had met her and Lutie upon the mountain. When he had finished, he begged Irene to tell him how it was that she had come to his rescue. So Irene too had to tell a very long story which she did in a rather roundabout manner, interrupted by many questions concerning things which she had not explained. But her tale, as he did not believe more than half of it, left everything as unaccounted accountable to him as it had been before, and he was nearly as perplexed as to what he must think of the princess. He could not believe that she was deliberately telling stories, not that there's anything wrong with telling stories, and only had to conclude, his only conclusion was that, that Lutie had been playing some trick upon the girl, inventing no end of lies to frighten her for her own purpose. 
But how ever did Lootie come to let you go up the mountain alone? he asked. Lootie knows nothing about it. I left her fast asleep. At least, I think so. I do hope my grandmother won't let her get into any trouble, for it wasn't her fault at all, as my grandmother very well knows. But how did you find your way to me? persisted Curdy. I already told you, said Irene, by keeping my finger upon my grandmother's thread, as I'm doing so now. You, you don't mean you've got the thread there? Of course I do. I've told you ten times so already. I have hardly, except when I was removing the stones, taken my fingers off it. There, she added, guiding Curdy's hand to the thread. You feel it yourself, don't you? I feel nothing at all, replied Curdy. Then what can be the matter with your fingers? I feel it perfectly. To be sure, it's very thin, and in the sunlight it looks just like a thread of spider though there are so many of them twisted together to make it. But for all that, I can't think why you shouldn't be able to feel it as well as I do. Curdy was too polite to say he did not believe that there was any thread there at all. What he did say was, well, I can make nothing of it. I can though, and he must be glad of that, for I shall do it for both of us. We're not out yet, said Curdy. We will soon be, though, returned Irene, confidently. And now the thread went down and led Irene to a hole in the floor of the cavern, whence came the sound of rushing water, which they had heard for some time. It goes into the ground now, Curdie, she said, stopping. He had been listening to another sound, which his practised ears had caught long ago, and which also had been growing louder. It was the noise of the goblin miners at their work and they seemed to be at no great distance now. Irene heard it the moment she stopped. What is that noise? she asked. Do you know, Curdie? Yes, it's the goblins digging and burrowing, he answered. And don't you know what they're doing it for? No, I haven't the least idea. Would you like to see them? he asked, wishing to have another try at finding their secret. If my thread took me there, I shouldn't much mind but I don't really want to see them, and I can't leave my thread. It leads me down into this hole, and we'd best be going at once. Very well. Shall I go first? asked Curdie. No, better not. You can't feel the thread, she answered, stepping down through the narrow break in the, fo in the floor into the hole. Oh, she cried out. I'm in the water. It's running very strong, but it's not deep. And there's just enough room to walk. Make haste, Curdie. He tried, but the hole was too small for him to get in. Go on a bit, he cried, shouldering his pickaxe. A few moments later, he had cleared a large opening and followed her. They went on, down and down, with the rushing water, Curdie getting more and more afraid, that, lest they should be led to some terrible gulf in the heart of the mountain. In one or two places, he had to break away the rocks to make room before even Irene could get through at least without hurting herself. But at length they spied a glimmer of light, and in a minute or more they were almost blinded by the full sunlight into which they emerged. It was some little time before the princess could see well enough to discover that they stood in her own garden, close by the seat on which she and her king puppy had sat that afternoon. They had come out of the channel of the little stream. She danced and clapped her hands with delight. Now, Curdy, she cried, won't you believe me, what I told you about my grandmother and her thread? For she had felt all the time that Curdy had not quite believed what she had told him. There, don't you see it shining before us? she added. I don't see anything, persisted Curdy. Then you must believe without seeing, said the princess, for you cannot deny it has brought us out of the mountain. I cannot deny that we are out of the mountain, and I should be very ungrateful indeed to deny that you had brought me out of it. I couldn't have done it but for the thread, persisted Irene. That's the part I don't understand. Well, come along, and Lutie will get you something to eat. I'm sure you must be very much in want of it. Indeed I am, but 
My father and mother, they will be so anxious about me. I must make haste, first up to the mountain to tell my mother, and then down to the mines to let my father know. Very well, Cardi, but you can't go without coming this way. You can't go without coming this way, and I shall take you through the house, for that is the nearest. They met no one along the way, for indeed, as before, the people were all about searching for the princess. They never got in the way, they never found Irene's thread, as she half expected when they went up the old staircase, and a new thought struck her. She turned to Curdie and said, My grandmother wants me. Oh, I skipped a page. Sorry, I'll go back a bit. Very well, Curdy, but you can't go without coming this way, and I will take you through the house, for it is the nearest. They met no one, by the way, for indeed, as before, oh, I didn't skip a page. I didn't skip a page. For as before, the people were here and there, everywhere searching for the princess. When they got in, Irene found that the thread, as she had half suspected, went up the old staircase, and a new thought struck her. She turned to Cardi and said, My grandmother wants me. Do come up with me and see her. Then you will be able to know that I've been telling you the truth. Oh, do come, please, Cardi. I couldn't bear it if you were to think I wasn't telling you the truth. I never doubted you believe what you said, returned Cardi. I only thought that you had some fancy in your head that could not be correct. But do come, Cardi. The little miner could not withstand this appeal, and though he felt very sh shy in what he seemed to be, in what seemed to him to be such a great house, he yielded and he followed her up the stairs.